Good evening, America. Welcome to your Monday edition of Just the News, No Noise. I'm your host, Amanda Head, reporting to you from Los Angeles, California. And if you have been keeping up with my amazing co-host, John Solomon's news site, justthenews.com, you have probably seen a pretty incredible article that his staff wrote up that explains why John has been absent this past week and, and will be the majority of this week. So it is with great sadness that we announce the death of John's amazing father, John F. Solomon III. John, who often went by Jack, he earned the nickname Super Sleuth by the New York Times back in 1995. He was not just a veteran of the U.S. Army Reserves. He also was a Connecticut State Trooper, a chief inspector at the state attorney's office, and he finished the last 17 years of his service as the town of Easton Police Department's chief. And from all the conversations that John and I have had about his family, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that his father was very proud of both of his sons for all of their accomplishments. John, as you all know, is an intrepid fact-finding investigative journalist and truth teller and multimedia host. And his brother, Mark, who followed in his father's giant footsteps, became a police officer and detective in Greenwich, Connecticut. Jack Solomon is survived by his wife, Marjorie, his brother, Martin, his sister, June, his two sons, his five stepchildren, and his 12 grandchildren. What a legacy. So I would just ask that you all keep John and his family in your thoughts and prayers. And also in lieu of flowers, the family is setting up a new Chief John Solomon Memorial Scholarship Fund to support Connecticut students seeking careers in law enforcement. So you can read more about the amazing life of John's father, Jack, and give today. So check out that article over on justthenews.com. In some sporting-related news, just about 24 hours ago, Scotty Scheffler won his second Masters green jacket down in Augusta, Georgia. The 27-year-old is now the fourth youngest two-time winner of this tournament and is now ranked number one in the PGA Tour world rankings as well as being their top money leader. But to Scheffler, it doesn't seem like it's all about the Benjamins. Here's what he had to say before the tournament began. It's hard to describe the feeling, but I think that's what defines me the most is my faith. You know, I believe in one creator and I've been called to come out here, do my best, compete and uh, glorify God. And that's pretty much it. And after the tournament, he once again spoke about his faith proudly. So no, no doubt he is a classy winner. And I imagine his career is going to explode even more. Now, while we get into the latest attack on Israel committed by Iran in just a moment, some other news that we're going to be watching unfold throughout the day. Pro-Palestine protesters have blocked the Golden Gate Bridge just hours after a group shut down nearly every lane of traffic that goes into Chicago's O'Hare International Airport. Meanwhile, all lanes northbound Interstate 880 near Fifth Avenue in Oakland, California. They were also blocked off due to a Free Palestine protest where participants chained themselves to black barrels. The protesters have reportedly said that their protests are a part of a worldwide economic blockade in solidarity with Palestine. So more on this to come throughout this week as they continue their uprising in the streets of New York, London, and other places across the globe. I should say fit throwing anyway. Meanwhile, up on Capitol Hill, Republicans have been teeing off on the Biden administration for easing sanctions on Iran, drawing a straight line from the president's policy decisions and the drone attacks launched against Israel over the weekend. Texas Senator Ted Cruz said in a statement, quote, these attacks are enabled and financed by deliberate policy choices made by Joe Biden and Biden officials who have allowed roughly $100 billion to flow to Iran since 2021. Americans and Israelis have been made catastrophically more vulnerable by these policies, unquote. Now, these bring in expert. Let's bring in the experts to break down what happened over the weekend and where we could be heading. Robert Greenway serves as the Heritage Foundation's director of the Center for National Defense, and he is an alumnus of the Trump National Security Council. Robert, welcome back to the show. My pleasure to be with you and my condolences to John and his family for their loss. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And, and I will definitely pass that on to him. I wanted to start with the, the posture that I have seen practically all over the internet, not just on social media, but in headlines. The opinion that because of Israel's far superior air defense system that I think intercepted about 99% of this close to 300 uh, missiles and drones coming from Iran, that that makes it a win for Israel. I, I have a real hard time putting this in the win column for Israel, but I would love to get your thoughts. 
Yeah, no, appreciate you having me on. Look, over 300 munitions were launched. About half of those were viable and made their way to targets in the Israel and other partners and allies, including the United States and the United Kingdom. And the Kingdom of Jordan uh, succeeded in, as you said, taking out 99% of those that survived. Now, that is a remarkable feat uh, in a testament to the integrated air defense system of Israel and its allies and partners, including the United States. But you're right. That is not a success story, to say the least. That uh, unprecedented act from Iran directly against another state is, an un is a declaration of war and an escalation that has uh, escaped the bounds of the cycle we've been in thus far and constitutes a grave risk to everyone now. And Israel must respond because of the public and overwhelming nature of what Iran launched. And again, the, the audience here for Iran is the region as well as its own domestic population. And the region is looking at what the United States and Israel are going to do in response to it. And if nothing is done, they'll judge that a green light continues to exist. Absolutely. And, you know, the Biden administration is, is in a really tricky spot because of what I talked about at the top of the hour with Palestinian protests, all of these protest votes against Joe Biden throughout the primary season. Um, but Biden has said that, that Netanyahu should basically pocket the win. I'm just trying to see from the Biden administration's perspective, why do you think, and I do think it's a selfish reason, selfishly, they don't want Israel to respond. Yeah, I think there's a domestic political component of this. And as we've talked about this before, I think there are a number of factors that have contributed to it. And the, the situation in Gaza mm -hmm. is only one of them. I think ultimately, though, there's also an economic question here. I don't think an escalation is what the Biden administration wants because of the economic impact on everyday Americans. Price of gas is already high. Commodities and supply chains have been disrupted already because of what's going on in the Middle East. A greater escalation is going to have an even greater impact in an already fragile economy. And so I think there's lots of reasons why they'd not like to do it. Unfortunately, those policies got us to this point. Appeasement, as you read Secretary or uh, Senator Cruz's statement, is exactly what got us in this position. Providing Iran unlimited resources is not the right way forward. And ultimately, it's going to lead to greater escalation. Absolutely. And um, former Prime Minister Natalie Bennett tweeted out this six part tweet that that raised a lot of important issues, one of which he was talking about the nature of this attack and, and, and the fact that the fact that now their enemy, in this case, Iran, is going to try even harder with more sophisticated weapon, maybe not more sophisticated, but other weapons and different methods. And my concern is that I, I do think that this was an embarrassment for Iran, and that is because Israel is far superior militarily, especially with respect to their air defense system. But typically, when you see a petulant state like, like Iran failing on something like this and, and possibly being embarrassed on the world stage, they are only going to try harder unless Israel respond, responds. Do you think that's the case? There's no question Israel has to respond because, again, most of the region looked at this and, and recognizes that Israel is well prepared to deal with an Iranian attack, but they are not. And if the United States is going to, one, sit it out and two, allow this to occur, they're incredibly vulnerable. And that message is not left, I think, on everyone else in the region. And what's at stake, again, is control of the global energy markets and China's access into the region in its global ambitions. And so, look, I think at the end of the day, Israel must respond to it because of the overwhelming nature of the attack itself. And look, if, if we were shot at without effect, we'd celebrate, but we'd respond equally. Absolutely. Um, and I wanted to ask you about what you think the future holds, because um, Israel's war cabinet has been meeting. They met today and they're obviously discussing what uh, some type of response would look like with timing and scope being the two most important factors. As far as some type of, of response to this, what do you think will be the most effective? Well, uh, I think they've been debating a number of things. The, the, the Israel has enormous amounts of options available to it. Timing certainly plays into that. Unlike Iran, I don't think they have any advantage in advertising what they're going to do. So I don't suspect that we're going to find out ahead of time until it occurs. Second, I think it does have to be public. It has to be visible. Third, I think it has to be inside of Iran because of the nature of the attack against Israel itself from Iran. Now, the only debate then is in where and in what part of the Iranian uh, ecosystem do they conduct these attacks. And it's also important to remember that they're currently uh, celebrating Passover in Israel. And so for about two weeks or so, it's going to be a sensitive time inside the country and one they don't want to spend inside bomb shelters. At the end of the day, Israel will respond. They will respond swiftly and it'll be more effective than the Iranian attack.
Robert, I wanted to ask you about uh, some comments that President Trump made, because obviously under President Trump, uh, we saw the sovereignty over the Golan Heights. We saw the capital move to Jerusalem, obviously uh, all of the Abraham Accords. And President Trump said that he felt like this would not have happened under his tenure. You obviously are a former NSC, NSC, NSC under President Trump. Do you think that's the case? Well, the fact of the matter is it didn't. Uh, Iran was broke. Right. Um, the response after the Soleimani strike was 16 missiles, 12 of which made it to two air bases. And we had more than enough ample time uh, to get our troops into defensive positions and we anticipated them fully. And they signaled to us while the attack was underway that they wanted nothing to do with it. I was in the situation room when it happened. And they communicated this was over as far as they're concerned. Now we've seen over 300 munitions launched from Iran into Israel, a totally different circumstance. There's no question in my mind this would not have happened. And again, we weren't pursuing policies that enabled Iran access to over $100 billion to expand their defense enterprise, their surrogates and proxies. And that's what set all of this in motion. Well, and a huge portion of foreign policy is either incentivizing or disincentivizing with respect to economic sanctions and, and just things within the economic sector. And we know that under President Trump, Iran had, I think, $4 billion cash on hand when he left office, and it's now close to $100 billion. Do you think that that number has exploded even since then? Because I, I, as of the fall, I believe they were selling 3 million barrels a day. So I feel like that number has got to be even in excess of 100 billion. I, I think it absolutely is. And, and I think it's small wonder. They're producing now upwards of 3 million barrels a day and they're selling probably just north of two. The rest is domestic. And look, and all that goes to China, by the way. And, and, that, and the price of gas, as we talked about, which impacts Americans and everyone else, is high, but that's good if you're selling gas. And so if you're selling it north of $85 a barrel, then Iran is making an, an enormous windfall. To put it in perspective, one year of the Iranian defense budget at its apogee is about $50 billion. And so if you've made $100 billion of additional resources under the Biden administration, that's two entire years worth of a defense budget. That's not that's that's absolutely staggering amount. And all of that goes to support ter 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 terrorists and surrogate proxies around the region. Exactly. Uh, and China is all too happy to purchase up those barrels of oil from Iran. Um, I wanted to ask you finally about the economic impact on Americans, because we have seen the shipping, uh, the shipping boats seized. And that is going to make a, a huge impact on the United States, as well as a lot of other factors. Tell us about it. There's no question. Look, prices, Americans obviously know, are up 50 percent across the board since the Biden administration came in. Gas prices are also climbing uh, or over 50 percent. And just because of this weekend's attacks, we've almost lost all of our earnings in the S in the uh, in the Dow. And all of this is interconnected. At the end of the day, whether we need the, the Middle East oil and gas or not is irrelevant. The rest of the world does. China certainly does. And as this disruption continues, it just increases the cost on everyday Americans. And every time you go to the gas pump or the grocery store, you're going to feel the impact of bad policies on commodities in the region. And we're seeing it now. Yeah, that is absolutely right. Robert, we, we could not have done this without your insight. The Heritage Foundation is very lucky to have you. Thank you for being here, sir. My great pleasure. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. All right. Don't go anywhere, folks. When we come back, I'm going to be speaking with Ash Patel about the latest developments in the Donald Trump hush money case up in New York. So we're going to be right back after these commercials. Welcome back, America. Well, the jury selection began today in New York for Donald Trump's Stormy Daniels hush money trial, the first ever criminal trial of a former U.S. president. Now, you may recall that Trump pleaded not guilty to 34 felony counts related to charges that he allegedly paid hush money to the adult film star Stormy and then covered it up. Well, a few weeks ago, Trump dismissed the notion that he uh, could go to jail at the conclusion of the, quote, Biden trial, suggesting instead that he could actually benefit from the publicity because, quote, people know it's a scam, unquote. Joining me now to talk more about this is one of my favorite guests, especially when it comes to the continuing and enduring subject of Donald Trump's political persecution. Cash Patel is a former federal prosecutor, and he joins me now. Cash, welcome back to the show. Hey, it's great to be with you. Um, so I just want to start with what we learned this morning from Judge Mershon, that he plans to arrest Donald Trump if he doesn't show up for every day of trial. Uh, I believe he said that that is unless there is a good reason. And it doesn't seem like Donald Trump's own son's high school graduation 
uh, applies as a good enough reason. And Cash, I'm just thinking to myself, this would be a real good time for Congress to start an investigation into election interference and subpoena Judge Juan Mershon to come down to Washington. Yeah, it's great to be with you, Amanda. And you know what? I never thought about that, but it doesn't surprise me that you have the best idea I've heard yet. So maybe the Congress <laughs> will listen to you. But anything short of an audit of this type of political prosecution is a failure for the American people. The two-tier system of justice is wildly on display here. Look, I've picked over 60 juries in criminal court, in state and federal court. And the judge making an overt statement to Donald Trump, he did so for political purposes. He doesn't have to tell Donald Trump, if you're not here, I'm going to arrest you. That is part of criminal procedure. If Donald Trump wanted to be excused from this proceeding in any way, shape or form, like for his son's graduation, he simply puts in a motion through his lawyers. But this Trump wants to hypersensitize, hyper politicize every single aspect of this political persecution because he's in bed with the prosecutors and oh, not to mention that his daughter made at least $15 million from information that's coming out of his courtroom because for the representative from California, Adam Schiff, who just happens to be running for the United States Senate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, real convenient. I wanted to ask you about jury selection and the nature of the onus on Donald Trump's attorneys to find out as much as they can about each of these potential jurors especially in the age of social media, because I have no doubt that there are going to be some Trump haters in that pool who will try mm. to downplay their Trump hate. But uh, attorneys can look at their social media, right? They can look online. They can take advantage of any information at their disposal. Can they not? Yeah, look, normally a voir dire in this type of case, it's literally should be a misdemeanor at most, um, would take you an hour. Um, mm -hmm. But this is the most important case that has ever been brought in modern history. And it's going to take weeks to examine every one of these uh, proposed jurors' biases. What did they say on social media? Not just yesterday, five years ago, 10 years ago. Are they pro or against President Trump? Have they made disparaging comments about President Trump? Have they, in some cases, made disparaging comments about the judge or the prosecutors? You remember, the Constitution balances due process in favor of, of course, constitutional protections for the defendant, but there are some limited rights that the prosecution has as well. And so I would think the prosecutors are probably looking for those types of comments as well. But as you pointed out, they are New York City, and there's probably one in a hundred jurors that might be favorable for Donald Trump. And that's why they brought this case there. It is jurisdiction shopping, not to mention that it is an unlawful prosecution. But I hope President Trump's lawyers, and I believe they are, looking at every single aspect of every one of these lives. We have to watch out for this judge to see if he tries to improperly, what we say, rehabilitate a juror just to put him on the jury. So, Cash, I know that this all depends on what, what people are selected to be on the jury, but this is going to take, I don't know, a couple months at least. This is going to take us well into uh, election season. Obviously, we're in mm -hmm. primary season right now, but this is essentially election season. Um, what do you expect to transpire at the end? Well, first of all, factually from this case, not to putting aside that it should never have been legally brought, factually, right. this is not a hush money case. This, this has nothing to do with right. hush money. Because Donald yeah. Trump's former lawyer, when Donald Trump was president, wrote in a ledger while Donald Trump was president that he, Michael Cohen, who, by the way, is a convicted federal felon who went to prison for swindling people out of money and lying, is now going to build a prosecutorial case against Donald Trump by saying, oh, that money that my client paid me, I use for purposes X, Y, and Z, and he mislabeled it in a ledger. That is the allegation against President Trump. It has nothing to do with hush money. And the other star witness is supposedly going to be Stormy Daniels, who received money. But the facts are really important in this case. The ledger amounts don't add up to any sort of money payments that Michael Cohen may or may not have made to Stormy Daniels. And if Michael Cohen made those payments, payments, excuse me, and Donald Trump, who never directed him to do so, he, Michael Cohen did that on his own, if that turns out to be the evidence, it's still not a crime to charge Donald Trump with that because Michael Cohen was the one producing and conducting that activity. Yeah, and I'm so glad you brought up Michael Cohen because, I mean, Stormy Daniels seems to be the central figure in this trial. However, in the development, at least on paper of this case, it was in fact Michael Cohen. But now we are finding out more and more shady garbage about Michael Cohen. And it kind of seems to me that with respect to who they are going to actually put out there in the public on the stand, and who they are going to to dance around in front of the American people. It's not Michael Cohen. They're trying to suppress him and bring other people instead.
Yeah, look, any prosecutor who is worth uh, half a pound of, of intelligence would know that this is the worst witness ever in the history of criminal prosecutions and would never put them on the uh, witness stand. Look, this is why the Southern District of New York didn't bring this case, who equally hate Trump as much as these guys do, but they know they couldn't build a case around a convicted felon liar who has a past that is going to come out there on the witness stand. And this is why a previous district attorney refused to bring this very case in New York City itself. But these people are so politically hypercharged that they're going to look for pieces of paper and random incidents from uh, from years gone past to try and dirty up Donald Trump and convict him in the court of public opinion and also utilize a rigged jury system there in New York City to convict him inside this courtroom with evidence that is non-existent and largely made up. And the substitution of that largely made up and non-existent evidence is going to be wholly improper, impermissible evidence. But this judge will, of course, let it in. Yes. Yeah, of course. Um, OK, speaking of dirtying up someone who actually deserves it, disgraced former deputy FBI director Andrew McCabe, <laughs> who I once saw side by side with a cartoon rat with glasses on and now I can't unsee it. But anyway, he went on CNN and admitted uh, that the FISA application that he signed to spy on Trump uh, I, I believe the word he used was regrettable. Um, Cash, your thoughts on that? Look, let's just remind the audience who Deputy Director Andy McCabe is. He unlawfully leaked sensitive information during a political cycle to favor Hillary Clinton. Then he got caught and lied about it. And that was the justification for his firing. That's before Russiagate even happened. And as a result of that misconduct by uh, Andy McCabe, his wife got $700,000 for her campaign from the Hillary Clinton world, which she lost. Then this Andy McCabe would go on to improperly and unlawfully and illegally sign a FISA warrant to illegally surveil Donald Trump and him and his cohort there on CNN or whatever garbage network they were on, continue the disinformation campaign. Oh, it's not a surprise that Donald Trump would attack FISA. Yeah, Donald Trump is attacking your unconstitutional weaponization of FISA against him. He's the biggest target of it in U.S. history, and you are sitting there trying to resuscitate your past by going on a disinformation campaign. You, Andy McKay, broke the law. You, CNN, are violating America's faith in journalism by putting out a known liar. The only people that are corrupt are those that appear on your network. Yeah, and, and that weaponization against Donald Trump was just one instance of, I think it was 178,000 verified times that they mm -hmm. used FISA basically illegally. Um, on FISA, I wanted to ask you about what happened on Friday. Uh, you had the FISA reform bill uh, that passed 273 to mm -hmm. 147 with, I believe, 87 Republicans voting for it without any type of warrant requirement. I do believe that there's gonna be another vote coming up soon, uh, at yeah. least on procedure. What do you expect to happen? Look, I'm the guy that exposed Russiagate. I'm the guy that utilized FISA to manhunt terrorists. I'm the guy that's always going to tell you we need these tools to go out and protect this country. But I'm also the guy that tells you they are in serious need of reform. And when Congress fails to meet the mark because they wait till the last minute, it jeopardizes American national security. But let's not forget the most important thing. The FBI and DOJ's own unlawful conduct is why we are here. It's not Donald Trump. It's not the media. It's the fact that the FBI and DOJ broke the law themselves and broke the American trust in the FISA process that it's even on the cutting table to begin with. So I think we need to focus on that and make sure we assist Congress in instituting reforms that actually matter and not just political victories in the headlines. I think there needs to be a lot more reform that we talked about in our Russiagate report from six, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. Why Congress didn't act on that before just shows you another reason why Americans distrust the swamp so much so deservedly distrust. Cash, you are the guy. You are the guy in so many great ways. And today you are the guy, the perfect guy to come on and talk about all of this. And we appreciate you being here, especially anything Spygate related. You're the master. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a great day, Amanda. Same to you. All right, everybody, we're going to take another brief commercial break. But on the other side of that, I'm going to be speaking with Patrick Hedger about the IRS's direct file program on this tax day Monday. Tax day, time to pay Uncle Sam. Be right back.
Welcome back, America. Today is tax day. Wonderful. A day that feels like Christmas for the IRS and a day of mourning for pretty much everyone else, including myself. Now, this year, the IRS debuted its direct file program for Americans in a handful of states. Now, the goal of this pilot program is to give taxpayers a free alternative to paying for a third party software like TurboTax or H&R Block or actually going into one of those offices. And of course, many questions still remain about the program, like whether or not the IRS can deliver a comparable experience to these vendors, as well as whether or not the federal agency agency should even be trusted with it in the first place. So joining me now to talk more about this is Patrick Hedger. He is the executive director for the Taxpayers Protection Alliance, and he joins me now. Patrick, welcome to the show. Happy Tax Day. Yeah, yeah, that's one way to put it. I think most folks aren't so happy, myself included. I just filed. Uh, so not feeling super great, but happy to be here. Yeah, I'm smiling through the pain. Actually, I just filed an extension, so I'm just procrastinating, and I don't know how many extensions I can file, but I'm going to max it out. Speaking of, I want to ask you about this new pilot program. Um, I have seen a lot of folks out there saying that this direct file program is not trustworthy, it's kind of clumsy. What are your thoughts on it? Should people try it if it's available to them? Yeah, so there are two really big issues with direct file as an idea. The first is really looking at the IRS's performance as an agency on its core functions. Um, The IRS hasn't proven that it can walk, and now it's trying to chew gum and become a software company, and that's not something it really should be doing. Uh, The second is, do you really want to have the fox in the hen house, so to speak? There's something really important to having that adversarial market-driven relationship with having a private tax preparer uh, do your taxes for you and then going up against the IRS because ultimately the IRS's mission is to maximize revenue Um, and so it remains to be seen if folks that go through direct file are actually getting every dollar back and getting prompted for every exemption and deduction that they could be eligible for compared to a private tax prep software or private tax preparers Uh, so those are the two big problems that I see with IRS direct file well, and, and Patrick, honestly, on the tech side of things, I mean, I know that any type of online software is going to be vulnerable to hacking and information getting leaked and all of that. So even if you're going into an H&R block or something like that, they're going to be filing online. We're not saying that you can do this absent of the Internet. But I have learned in the past, history has taught me and history dictates that when the government tries to create an online portal for anything, a.k.a. Obamacare, it doesn't really work out. So that's my biggest concern is that let's say I jump through all the hoops and I do, you know, do this easy process. Who can who can promise me that it's not going to crash like Obamacare did? Who can tell me that it's not going to be vulnerable to some type of hacking like a lot of other government software programs have? I don't have any of those assurances, do I? No, you don't. And and, the Affordable Care Act exchanges are a really great example. Uh, First, on the cost side, the Government Accountability Office just came out with a report this week that found that the IRS basically grossly underestimated the cost uh, of this direct file program, and they found no basis for the IRS's cost estimates at all, Uh, and and, and found that the IRS hadn't even included the startup costs uh, for this software. So really problematic there. On the Affordable Care Act side, uh, I was forced to buy health insurance by the Affordable Care Act through the DC Health Exchange, uh, DC Health Link, and because of that, uh, myself and many uh, folks that live and work in the District of Columbia, all we all have to have um, uh, our credit frozen and uh, uh, dark web monitoring because the DC Health Link leaked my most sensitive information, social security number, you name it, um, of myself and members of Congress. Um, so that's a pretty close parallel to the sort of security flaws that we could find with the, the direct file program. And just the IRS in general, in August, the Government Accountability Office again put out a report about what the IRS needs to do to better safeguard uh, user data. And they found they made 15 specific recommendations to the IRS and not one of them has been addressed yet, according to the Government Accountability Office. So again, it gets back to that walk and chew gum issue. Why is the IRS not devoting resources to the basic things we expect it to do, like securing our data, and now trying to compete with private sector firms that have already been doing this for years and know what they're doing? Yeah, I I don't know many other three-letter agencies in Washington that I trust less than the IRS, and there are a whole lot of them. They're all at the bottom of the barrel. 
Um, I wanted to ask you, though, about Mark Cuban and some comments that he made online. And I think that he was trying to dunk on President Trump. I wasn't familiar with simping for the IRS as a form of dunking on Donald Trump, but he tweeted, I pay what I owe. Tomorrow, I will wire transfer to the IRS 288, uh, what is that, million dollars. This country has done so much for me. I'm proud to pay my taxes every single year. Tag a former president uh, that you know doesn't. Um, wow, that, that is a whole lot of allegiance to the IRS, Patrick. Yeah, it, it's sort of a weird comment because everybody, whether you're a multi-billionaire or you're just trying to squeak by, is going to use t the tax laws to their advantage to keep as much money as yes. they can. That's just the rational incentive that we all have as human beings. You know, that's great. It's great that he's able to contribute so much. Uh, it's because of he's had so much success. That's fantastic. Um, but if he feels like he needs to contribute more, the IRS and the Treasury have an option for that. It's, it's something interesting that I see when you see a lot of progressive billionaires saying, tax me more, tax me more. You can cut yeah. a check as a gift to pay down the debt anytime you want. And they just they never seem to do it. You absolutely can. Yep. Go ahead. Um, OK, speaking of millionaires and billionaires, a report recently came out that the IRS, who promised to go after millionaires and billionaires with new agents and new funding. Oh, lo and behold, 63 percent of new audits as of last summer target people who make less than two hundred thousand dollars. Now, that might have sounded like a lot of money five years ago, but in Joe Biden's economy, that really doesn't put you uh, in a position where you're actually doing very well in Bidenomics. Um, I, I, what do you make of this? Yeah, I mean, it's entirely predictable prior to during this debate when we talked about new IRS enforcement. There's a really in, interestingly enough, the data has been put together by ProPublica, who generally hosts a lot of this data that gets leaked by the IRS. But they also have uh, data related to where audits are happening in the IRS. And they made this map that shows the counties in the United States where audit rates are the highest. And if you lined that map up next to a treasury map of where the most low income folks and the most minority populations are, um, those look like the same map, which tells you that the IRS is actually going after disproportionately low income and minority taxpayers. Um, and that's because those are the folks that don't have the resources to fight back. They don't have the accountants and the lawyers to be able to contradict uh, what the IRS is saying. They usually just have to take it. And now the IRS is, instead of just going after that low-hanging fruit that they traditionally have gone after, they've just moved kind of one step up and are starting to go after middle income taxpayers, uh, maybe even upper middle class taxpayers. But again, this is not the guy sitting on his yacht in the Cayman Islands. This is really the average small business owner, sole proprietor um, that has a lot of business revenue that looks like personal revenue that may, may count as, as, as putting them into that tax bracket, but are, are cash poor individuals. So it's really concerning, but entirely predictable. The IRS is responding to the incentives in front of it, and you'd much rather go after somebody who doesn't have the same resources to fight back than, say, a Mark Cuban. Mm -hmm. um, OK, I hate to even ask this question because I don't want to think of the prospect of the reality of it. But if Joe Biden wins again in November and there is a second Biden term, what 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 do taxpayers expect? Yeah, so there are a lot of provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the Trump tax cuts from 2017 that will expire. And the rate cuts across the board, all income levels saw an effective rate cut, uh, will revert back to prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So you'll see higher taxes immediately. Um, and we'll also see one of the big things that's I think most problematic for, for the most amount of people is the reversion of the standard deduction back to what it was prior to the Trump tax cuts. The standard deduction uh, was effectively doubled by the Trump tax cuts, and that one provides a huge tax cut for folks that have simple taxes. You're able to deduct a lot more than you previously were, but it also makes tax compliance a lot easier. So if you had uh, itemized deductions that were uh, kind of right up against um, you know, what the standard deduction is, sometimes it's easier to just take the standard deduction, file your taxes in a few right. minutes. And, and so yeah. tax compliance will become much more difficult and much more expensive. Ugh, I nearly threw up when I asked that question. That's why it took me so long to get it out. <laughs> Patrick, nobody likes paying taxes. Nobody likes even talking about it, but we have to do it, especially today on tax day. And you are the best person to have on to do that with us. So thank you so much. All right, everybody, we're going to take a quick commercial break, but we'll be back on the other side of these messages.
Welcome back, everybody. Tomorrow will mark three weeks since that horrific tragedy in Baltimore when the container ship Dolly crashed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge, causing the bridge to collapse and leading to the death of six people. This morning, federal agents boarded that ship as part of an FBI probe investigating the incident, including whether or not the ship crew was aware that the vessel had serious system problems when it left the port in the early morning of that crash. So our next guest has been following this story very closely. Brent Sadler is a commercial shipping expert and former Pentagon official who now serves as senior research fellow for the Heritage Foundation. And he joins me now. Brent, great to have you back on the show, despite these latest circumstances. Thank you very much for having me on, Amanda. All right. So you've got these FBI agents who stepped on that ship this morning, a, a criminal probe, I believe. What do you expect for them to uncover? Do you think that the folks who were operating that ship left that, mor- ship left that morning knowing something could go horribly wrong in this case? Well, well, no sailor gets underway or gets on a ship that they know has a, has a very high probability of having a, a mechanical or a, a failure out at sea because that's actually – it's a death a death wish on yourself because when you're in the middle of the ocean, uh, there's no one that can really save you necessarily in time. So no sailor knowingly does that. That being said, shipping is a for-profit business, and it's probably one of the things that has to be looked at is under what pressure were they made to get underway when they did? Uh, was there any undue pressure to overlook if there was any knowing material issues? But one issue stands out, and it's the absence of any commentary on the potential for a cyber intrusion. Doesn't mean that it is the cause, but or but it at the very least needs to be seriously looked at. And it's interesting that a month before this this incident, the White House a- actually issued new guidance about Chinese cranes that do have a cyber intrusion uh, vector for attack. And we know that there are similar problems on systems on our commercial ships. Hmm. Well, that's serendipitous. Um, speaking of that, I, you know, I don't know if, if a cyber attack was the case uh, with the ship Dolly, but I'm pretty sure that that has happened already multiple times, especially with respect to things that can affect our, our supply chains and our shipping lines. Do you think that's the case as well? I think it has to be seriously investigated. There has been resistance during the Trump administration uh, by agencies that are charged to do this because it's either too hard, too lengthy, or they don't have the expertise in-house to do it. Now, that's been years since. We need to do better. And so my point is that this this incident, this this, uh, collision in Baltimore Harbor needs to become the new benchmark to thoroughly look at all of the potential vectors of attack or mismanagement or material failure so that we don't have a repeat or that a hostile party like China can't take advantage of it at a time and a place of their choosing and bring our economy to a, to a halt. Mm. Um, speaking of our economy and uh, shipping lines in, I guess, specifically Strait of Hormuz a few months ago, but I want to shift gears over to the Israeli conflict. Um, there has been a bit of mixed messaging coming from the Biden administration. They claim that their commitment to Israel is ironclad. They also say the same thing about NATO. And I'm just trying to figure out how those two can be absolutely true at the same time. Well, I mean, it's probably an understatement of mixed messages. It's actually probably mismanagement is also probably being a little too kind to our folks in the White House today. Um, Clearly, the message of deterrence has failed. And clearly, the shipping that we have right now going through the Red Sea and also increasingly through the Straits of Hormuz are, are under attack. And it's placing not just American merchant mariners, which there are too few, but allies like the Philippines and our NATO allies, the Portuguese, who had their ship just taken taken hostage or taken over uh, by the Iranians in the Strait of Hormuz literally hours before their mass cruise and ballistic missile attack uh, on Israel over the weekend. Brent, are you saying that Joe Biden's warning to Iran, don't, wasn't enough to deter the attack? Well, if you only have words and there's nothing there to see to back it up, it's meaningless. And so for a group that has relied on articulation and narratives, but not backing it up with any meaningful actions, uh, it's, it's no wonder that people like the mullahs in Tehran, Putin in Moscow, and hopefully not, 
but also probably the Chinese in Beijing are not taking the United States seriously. And the most dangerous is if China decides to act and crosses a red line in the South China Sea, where they've been really ratcheting up the tensions with the Philippines. Yeah. I, I just keep thinking, I can't remember if it was Sun Tzu or Machiavelli. One of them said it's better to be feared than loved. And I just don't think that this administration uh, is feared or on the foreign stage. And I don't think they're even loved on the domestic stage. I wanted to ask you, though, speaking of mixed messaging, Iraq's prime minister visited with Biden today and he was checking his watch a number of times. Um, but this was this is, of course, in the midst of this Iranian attack on Israel that took place over the weekend. Some missiles were launched from Iraqi territory. What kind of message does that send? Well, I think awkward would would definitely be the, the, the defining care, defining word for this meeting. The timing for for the Iraqi prime minister couldn't be worse, like right on the heels of the first massive attack from Iranian territory to include Iraqi soil into Israel. So I think first and foremost, it's the conditions and the missions of the U.S. forces that are still there, supporting the Iraqi government, mind you, in its fight against ISIS. And certainly there are factions there in his own government in Baghdad who would like the U.S. to leave and to usher in a much more favorable Iranian-supported government. And so it's a it's a three way fight right now in Baghdad between the Kurds in the north and the Sunnis in the Shia. Yeah, um, Brent, before we let you go, you know, elections sometimes weigh more heavily on the domestic side than they do the foreign policy side. This time around, I think we've got issues in both departments. President Trump, obviously peace for four years under him. Is it time for him to start pitching to the American people that he is the peacekeeping president? Oh, I think it's anything better than what we've been uh, suffering under the last few years. It's, it's again, I can't characterize any other way than mismanagement and a willful misunderstanding of the world as it operates. And it's one that's really rule, rule of the jungle. And peace only comes with force or with strength. And um, the sooner that we get someone in the office that understands that, I think the better that all parties will be. Yeah. I've seen Taco Bell's run by high schoolers that are managed better than this administration. It's unbelievable. Brent, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Uh, so much to break down from this past week, and we're going to have a lot more in the future. So we'll have you back on. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Have a good day. Same to you. All right. Don't go anywhere. We're off to a quick commercial break. But when we return, I'm going to be speaking with Just the News' evening editor, Ben Whedon, about the latest in Hunter Biden's attempts to have a federal judge dismiss some of the charges brought against America. As we approach another critical election, a wave of concern is washing over this country. Recent studies reveal that an astonishing 56 percent of our fellow citizens report feelings of anxiety or dread about the upcoming presidential election. That's why I stand with AMAC. AMAC is more than a senior discount organization. During these challenging times, they fight for common sense and hope that our nation returns to traditional American values. Visit amac.us forward slash just news today to seize this exclusive election year special, a four year AMAC membership for just $30. That's unbelievable. As an AMAC member, you not only enjoy money saving benefits, but also the AMAC magazine, free social security and Medicare advice, a trusted voice in Washington in a community of like-minded patriots who love this great country and want to keep it the way it was. Take advantage of this election year special, four years for $30 and be part of the solution over the next four years by becoming an AMAC member. Now, when you do that, you're strengthening a movement dedicated to preserving the principles we all hold dear. Join now at amac.us slash just news. That's amac, A-M-A-C dot U-S forward slash just news. Welcome back, everybody. On Friday, U.S. District Judge Mary Ellen Norica refused to dismiss the, dismiss the federal gun case brought against Hunter Biden by special counsel David Weiss. Now, attorneys for the president's son argued that he is the victim of political persecution, but Judge Norica was not buying it. The ruling increases the likelihood that Hunter Biden will face trial this summer, beginning on June 3rd. So joining me now to discuss this and more is Just the News evening editor, Ben Whedon. Thanks so much for joining me. Well, thanks for having me, Amanda. Okie dokie. So this is the same judge who asked just a few questions last year 
about uh, the sweetheart deal, and then it all crumbled and fell apart. Not dissimilar to Joe Biden, or excuse me, Hunter Biden's also Los Angeles case uh, on tax charges, where he said that this was politically motivated. And I'm just trying to understand for Hunter Biden how this is politically motivated, considering the person who's appointed to head up the DOJ is the person appointed by his own father. Well, I think the judge had trouble figuring that out, too, because she rejected his bid to dismiss the charges. And you remember, this is the same judge who looked at the original plea deal. You know, before David Weiss got named special counsel, they brought this agreement to her. And included in that was this pretrial diversion agreement that she took issue with. It was a what she see, saw as something of an unprecedented arrangement where, you know, Hunter Biden was going to be able to avoid charges by going through this program that it would eventually get dismissed. And what was going to be in that that she took issue with was actually an immunity provision. And she said, I don't really know that this is going to work inside uh, the, this mechanism that you've arranged here. And so that happens. Public scrutiny of this deal comes out. And then it, this is at the same time the IRS whistleblowers are making noise about political interference. The deal falls apart. Weiss later gets named special counsel and then brings the charges again in October. And again, this is about him allegedly lying on a federal gun form about being a drug user while he's actually trying to buy a gun. And then it's also charges related to him possessing that gun while still being a drug user. Um, political motivations, difficult to discern. It certainly sounds like the judge had trouble uh, buying that line of argument. Yeah, they found, what, what was it, cornstarch or baby powder or something on that gun? What was it? It was a... Uh... It was a powder, and it, there seems to be some ambiguity about exactly what it was, but you know, the speculation at the time was, of course, that it was something, well, illegal. Yeah, snow skiing, as they call it out here in Los Angeles. All right, let's switch gears to what's happening in the House in light of what took place in Israel over the weekend. The GOP-led House, of course, has scheduled votes on Iran sanctions bills Monday after attack on Israel. Can you give us a rundown of that? Yeah, so there's five sanctions bills coming in. They're actually discussing them on the floor as we speak. Uh, most of these are looking at targeting Iranian income streams in the wake of this uh, strike on Israel that uh, they say is retaliation for an alleged targeting of their embassy in Syria. Um, and what they're looking at here, uh, most interestingly, is Chinese firms importing Iranian oil. That's the big one to be watching, which you know signals that they're looking at this broader Russo-Iranian-Chinese bloc that uh, intelligence community has been warning about for quite a while now. And they're starting to recognize that Iran has certain economic lifelines. You know, this, in, this regime is still there, is still functioning despite the already significant sanctions against it. And they're looking at where they're actually finding ways to get around this or to, you know, subvert them. Hmm. Okay. All right. I want to try to squeeze in one more story regarding the impeachment of Alejandra Mayorkas. Uh, it obviously passed out of the House, went to the Senate, stalled out like a Ford Pinto, hopefully also like a Ford Pinto, it doesn't absolutely explode. But Ted Cruz has argued that the Senate has a constitutional obligation to hold that impeachment trial in the Senate. Your thoughts? Certainly. So he's broken down a lot of the prior instances of impeachment and looked at the few cases where there weren't trials. And in most of those cases, there was either a jurisdictional concern or the person in question was no longer in office, rendering it mute. You know, originally, these articles of impeachment were supposed to come in last week. Uh, Senate conservatives got Mike Johnson to delay until this week, mostly because the Congress coming back in from recess, they were kind of worried that these would get looked at on Thursday. Congress would have just come back from break and not really wanted to deal with it and just tabled them because Schumer has signaled he's not really that interested in pursuing a trial. There seems to be a debate about whether they're actually going to bring it at all. And so, you know, they were supposed to send them over today. I'm not sure if they have done it yet. But, you know, having this trial at this point, you can't really just let an impeachment vote. And this is one of the only cases of impeaching a you know, incumbent cabinet secretary that I could, at least that I can think of in history. So simply letting yeah. it go and w without even a vote on tabling would certainly be unprecedented. Yeah, to say the least. And I think the American people would view that some sort of certain way. Ben, it is always great talking politics with you. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. And everybody, you can go check out his work over on justthenews.com and i would encourage all of you to go over there as well and read about john's father jack solomon and you can find information there about how you can donate to that scholarship fund so that's it for us tonight we're going to be back tomorrow night at six o'clock eastern right here on real america's voice grant stenchfield is going to take the wheel